Well, welcome to Blackhawk. My name is Chris. It's great to be with you this morning. The air conditioning is working, even though it's going to be a warm day outside. If you're in the room with us, would you stand if you're able and join us in singing? Welcome to everyone watching online and in the family room. Let's worship together. I don't have to be a 
This is my Father's word, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my. come and we worship and we just declare and we remember this morning that though the wrong seems off so strong, that God, you are the ruler yet. But in the midst of that, we come and man, it's been a rough couple of weeks. It's been a rough couple of months with things like the war in the Ukraine and the shootings over the past couple of weeks in Uvalde, Texas and Southern California and in Buffalo. God, the wrong seems so strong right now. But we pray for you, God, who sit on your throne and you rule. You continue to hold all things together, even in the midst of the pain and the suffering. We pray that you would bring comfort and hope and peace to those who woke up this morning and they're still mourning the loss of a loved one or these communities that have been deeply impacted by these shootings. God, would you bring peace? Would you bring comfort? As we sang in that first song, would you work all things together for your good? 
God, your kingdom is not yet fully here yet, but we as your church, as your people, get to be a part of bringing change, of being a light, of bringing hope to those around us. And so even today, as we open up your word, as we continue to worship, would we be formed into the kind of individuals, but the kind of church who shines for you, who shines hope and comfort and peace into the darkness? God, would you show up this morning. You're already here. We don't need to ask you to come and to be present, but would you move in our hearts and our minds? We give you permission to do that this morning. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said together, amen. Thank you, Chris. Well, good morning to you. Welcome to Blackhawk Church. My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors on staff. If you're joining us online, for all of you who are worshiping with us online, wherever you are, it is great uh, to be able to worship together with you. For all of you in the room, it's good to see you today. Um, let me invite you to go ahead and take your seats. And fifth and sixth graders, normally we dismiss you, but you're here with us for the summer. Uh, so it's great to have you guys in the service with us. Well, this is Memorial Day weekend, and I think for most of us, uh, that involves a three-day weekend. Uh, where we get to have different hangouts with people, maybe grill and do things like that. But in the midst of all that, we want to just encourage you to take a moment to remember the freedoms that we enjoy as a country and the sacrifice that so many have made uh, for us to have those freedoms. And if you're a family member of someone, a loved one who has lost their lives in serving our country, uh, we pray God's comfort over you in these days as you remember, as you reflect. Uh, and we're happy to pray with you or talk with you after the service if you'd like that. Next Sunday, June 5th, uh, we're going to kick off kind of the summer here at our Braderway site with Braderway on the lawn. Uh, this will be right out here. If you're here in the room, this is to my right outside the room, uh, the East Lawn. And we're going to have free Kona ice and some activities, uh, some different lawn games and things like that. Whether you're new or whether you've been coming here a long time, this is a great chance to get to know some others who are part of our Braderway community. And if you're joining us online and you live in our Madison area, we invite you to come and get to know some of the folks who are around here Sunday after Sunday. Uh, great opportunity to kind of kick off summer and have some fun together. So that's next week after both of the services out on the East Lawn. All right, well, last Sunday was Love Madison, and it was really fun to have almost 1,100 volunteers out in our community serving in different projects uh, all over our various communities. I think there were 47 projects that represented 33 different partner organizations that we're working with. Uh, there was also a Love Dodgeville that took place. I know there's some Blackhawkers out there watching from Dodgeville who started Love Dodgeville. And I think there was a strong volunteer showing out there last week, as well as some of you who are watching from Baraboo, uh, who did a Love Baraboo type event as well. So uh, really fun to see what it looks like to just be hands and feet of Jesus worshiping together, but out in our communities in really practical ways as we serve together. To get an idea of that day, uh, why don't you check this out? We're here at Love Madison 2022. This is Lauren, who's the executive director of Three Gates. And Lauren, thank you so much. The purpose of Three Gates, it's a therapeutic horsemanship center. So we use the power of horses to help people who have a disability reach any goals they might have. And when you folks come out, you're part of that 200 volunteer court that make this place run. And today we are framing the walls for uh, two uh, future homeowners. Habitat could not do what it does without the help of folks like Black Hawk. Uh, doing the actual volunteer labor, I mean, that keeps it affordable on the front end. We can then sell it to the owners at an affordable mortgage. It's really gonna be transformative. We are working on gardening today. We serve about 400 students here and we have a sustainable gardening educational project. So because of this garden, we have educational outdoor space for kids to thrive in. Because of all of the volunteers, um, we've been able to sustain this and make this more and more beautiful. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. We have been partnering with Black Hawk for the last 10 years. It's just so heartwarming to have people come out here and say, I will help you pull the weeds from that garden bed, or let me help you move this log. 
and so that when students come out here, they can engage in the learning that happens out here. We can't do that without folks like you from Blackhawk to help us out, so thank you so much. Yeah, so it was really fun, yeah. <laughs> fun to see so many of you out there, and we heard just amazing things from our partners uh, beyond what was on the video. Uh, some of the partners who were just like, the crew that you sent out was amazing to work with. Uh, we got so much done. We had one, one partner who said, like, they got about a year's worth of stuff done in that day because of just the, you know, the tight budgets they have for staffing and things like that, and that so many volunteers could get the work done. So... Just really cool to see um, the church out doing practical service in our community. So uh, thanks so much to all of you who were involved. It was a great day, and we hope you'll continue some of that involvement through the course of the year with all these different partners. All right, well, we are in our Micah series, so I'm going to hand it now to Charles for today's message. I don't know about you, but these days a lot of my spare time is spent keeping up with what's going on with the war in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, I know many of us, we see the war in stark moral terms, and we care deeply about the outcome of that war and the impact it's having on the Ukrainian people. However, a couple of weeks ago, as I was reading up on what's happening in the Donbas area, a thought crossed my mind, like, and a question that popped in my head, and I, I was thinking, I wonder how many wars there's been in my lifetime. So I just kind of jotted down a quick list off the top of my head of the ones I remember, and here's that list. Um, Vietnam, Grenada, it tells, tells you how old I am, right? Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, Iraq 1, Somalia, former Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Iraq 2, Libya, and Syria, and now Ukraine. And uh, I was like, okay, I wonder which ones I missed, which ones I didn't hear about, or which ones I've forgotten. So I did a Google search, and it turns out I didn't miss a few. I missed most of them. You see, okay, okay, so it depends on how you count, okay? Forget, like, my lifetime, okay? Starting from the year 2000 till now, there's been over 100 wars in this world, and there are actually over 40 of them going on right now. As it turns out, we human beings, we fight wars. We fight lots of wars. Wars are not an exceptional event in human history. Wars are the norm. And that dovetails with what the Bible says about who we are. We are broken people living in a broken world. And one of the most obvious ways to know that the world is broken, we fight wars. History progresses, technology advances, and we can't stop fighting wars. We just kill each other in increasingly more creative and more technologically advanced ways. I know, like, that's a really depressing train of thought. Some of you are like, why did I come to church today? Oh my gosh, it's Memorial Day. I know, I get it. I get it. So here's the thing. We need to sit in the darkness of this world before we can truly appreciate the light that God gives. Here at Blackhawk, we often say, hey, Jesus came and died on for us on the cross, forgiven our sin, we're reconciled with God. That's the good news. That is the good news. But the good news goes beyond that. What does God have in mind for a world, for a planet that is driven, driven apart by ethnic hatred and by peoples attacking other peoples and killing each other? What does the Bible have to say about that? That's what we're talking about today. Today, we're going to look at a passage that has this impossibly grand vision for our world. And we need to at least have some reminders of the horrors of war before we can truly sit and marvel at the hope that God offers us. 
Now, before I keep going, let me introduce myself. My name is Charles. I'm one of the pastors on the teaching team. Greetings to those of you who are here and those of you joining us in traditions, Gospel Fusion, downtown Fitchburg. Shout out to those of you who are watching online and those of you listening to our podcast. To the Chinese speakers, to the Spanish speakers, es un gusto de nos aquí con nosotros. And to everyone, welcome to Blackhawk Church. We're so glad you're here. Now, we are in a sermon series on the book of Micah. Micah lived about 2,700 years ago. He was a prophet. Uh, God sent him to God's people to tell his people that God is angry. And so Micah's book has two major themes. One is a theme of judgment. The other is a theme of hope. And so for the first three weeks of the series, we talked about judgment. Right? Why is God angry? Well, it turns out their society is unjust and their leaders are corrupt. And then for the last two weeks, uh, Pastor Matt and Pastor Daniel talked to us about Micah chapter 6, verse 8. What does God require from his people? It's to do justice, do mishpat, to love mercy, to love chesed, and to walk humbly with God. And so this week and the next week, we're actually now in the section of hope. So, you know, everybody can breathe a sigh of relief. <sighs> All right, hope section. So if you have your Bible with you, please turn to Micah chapter 4. We're starting with verse 1. This is a very famous passage. You probably heard it before, quoted all over the place. There's something actually interesting about this passage. It's that a version of the same passage shows up in the book of Isaiah chapter 2. And so immediate question, who wrote, who copied? Nobody knows. I like to think it's Micah because Isaiah gets a lot more press. But okay, so <laughs> here's Micah chapter 4 verse 1. In the last days... The mountain of Yahweh's temple. When you see the word Lord in all caps, that's God's personal name, Yahweh. The mountain of Yahweh's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of Yahweh, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law, the Torah, will go out from Zion, the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples. He will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Instead, everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. And no one will make them afraid. For Yahweh Almighty has spoken. That's the grand vision. Let's start from the beginning, okay? When will this happen? Uh, Micah says, last days. Now, what, is that? what does Micah mean by that? So a quick reminder about how the Old Testament people see human history. So the Old Testament divides human history into two periods. There is the former days and the last days, all right? So Micah is his, himself living in the former days. He, he, it's, a, it's, a day, it's a day of brokenness. The world is broken. There's injustice. There's violence. There's hatred. There's illness. There's death. And of course, there is warfare. And he sees a day is coming. A day is coming when God is going to show up big time, and he's going to change world history. And he is going to fix one of the biggest problems with our world. And that is this. Verse 3 tells us that he is going to settle disputes for the nations. Yeah, the nations. Now, the Hebrew word for nations is goim. Here, the same word over here, goi. It refers to ethnic groups, people groups, language groups, right? And so, what God's going to do is, he is going to fix their problems. What Micah is saying is, they're gonna, he's going to show up and fix major problems. So, imagine India, Pakistan, dealt with. Israel, Palestine, done. In fact, the whole Middle East, done. Russia, Ukraine, the Korean Peninsula, Taiwan Strait, Ethiopia, all the places where war is happening or right on the doorstep, God shows up and he makes peace. Who is God in this passage? He's an international peacemaker. This is who our God is. Our God is a God who makes peace. Now here's the thing. The kind of peace that God makes is different from the kind of peace that we humans make. You see, the, the peace that we humans make, they're temporary. They don't last very long. Right? Let's say you have a ceasefire. You sign a peace treaty. 
What's happening? Well, there's still fear, right? There's still distrust. There's still anger and anxiety and hatred. So what do you do? Well, you store up weapons, you train an army, and you get ready to fight the next war. And guess what? So does our enemies. Those of us old enough to remember the Cold War, uh, you remember learning in school about the doctrine of deterrence, nuclear deterrence. We learned that if we have enough nuclear weapons so that they can survive a nuclear first strike, the Russians, the Soviet unions, would not dare to attack us. It was called mutual assured destruction. That was the foundation of peace during the Cold War. That is not the kind of peace that God makes. They would beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. What Micah is saying is this. There is a peace that does not depend on deterrence. There is a peace that does not depend on my ability to strike back. There is a peace that does not depend on accumulating massive army and weapons to intimidate other people so they don't dare attack us. Instead, there is a peace where the nations of the earth gather together and they take their tanks and their artillery and their rockets and their planes and their submarines and they repurpose them for what is good for human life. Like farming equipment. And that's just what the nations give rid of their weapons. They stopped training for war. I grew up admiring those in the military tradition. My dad was a major in the Taiwanese Air Force. One of my uncles was actually a, a captain in the Taiwanese Navy. And had things gone according to my plans, I would have attended West Point and had a career in the US Army. I think that the study of military arts is critical and central because they provide the security and the protection of our country. Those in the military tradition, the military community, they are the first in line to defend the rest of us. So those of you right now, those of you who, are, who have been in the military, those of you who, who are serving the military right now, I just want to say thank you for your service. And can we give them a round of applause? I also have bad news for you. You're going to be out of a job in the last days. By the way, preachers and pastors were out of a job too. So, but that's a different sermon. Okay. That's a different sermon. But, but here's the thing. In that day, West Point was shut down. Academies for training for the military arts will shut down. They will come to an end. So, so what Micah is saying is there's a, there's a peace in which there's no more fighting, the weapons are destroyed, no more training for war. Why will that happen? Well, two things. Number one, everybody will have what they need. This verse right here, sitting under their own vine and sitting in their own fig tree, that's an ancient Israelite image of contentment. You, you, got, you have to have an image in your head of kind of a Mediterranean setting, right? You have vines, and you have, you have fig tree, rows of them, and you have, this, you have this farmer, and he's not working his tail off, or, or she. They're sitting down under their fig tree, in the, un, under the vines, and they're sitting there, and they're going like this. And they're looking at their field, and there's harvest coming up, and there's growth coming up. They have everything they need to prosper for the good life. It's a picture of contentment. And number two, no fear. No fear that somebody will come along and rob and take and steal. No fear that another country will rise and launch a war of aggression. None of that. So how will this happen? And we come to the most important line of this entire passage. For Yahweh Almighty has spoken. For Yahweh Almighty has spoken. It is Yahweh himself who guarantees this peace. This is not just absence of conflict. It is a peace of, with prosperity for all and security for all. Yahweh underwrites this peace on earth. World peace. That's what we're talking about. Right? It's the dream of mankind. It's what we yearn for, world peace. It's why they actually created the United Nations. Um, if, you, if you actually look at this particular wall in the United Nations Plaza, it actually has this carved on it. 
They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. Sound familiar? Or, or how about the statue? Right on the grounds of the United Nations. It's a statue given by the Soviet Union to the UN in 1959, and it is a man beating his sword into plowshare. This is what we yearn for. This is what we humanity desperately want. In Micah chapter 4, Micah explains this great vision. Right? Micah explains this great vision in, in, in this passage, and, and our world wants it. But the problem, they always cut out the last line. Right? They, they like to quote these, these verses here. Right? They want to quote these verses. You got, you got weapons being destroyed. You got no more war here. You got uh, no more training for war. You got contentment. Everybody have what they need. They have no fear. They like this part. And then when it comes to the last line, they go, no, thank you. You, you have to understand this dynamic, okay? Our world has been deeply impacted by the Bible. Human rights. The, the, the struggle against slavery, the struggle against exploitation, the freedom of conscience, protection for property rights, racial reconciliation, goes on and on and on. The world borrows from the Bible, but they don't want the God that goes with it. They say, hey, the Bible has some really cool ideas, but we don't want the God who can actually make it happen. Here's my question. Here's my question. Does anybody out there seriously think that we human beings have the capacity, the wisdom, the temperament to make world peace happen on our own? Anybody? And if so, <laughs> then all of this, without the last line, unicorns and puppy dogs, pretty sounding words that mean absolutely nothing. That final line is everything. That final line is everything. Our God. Our God is the peacemaking God. Our God has the wisdom to resolve disputes. Our God has the power to guarantee security. Our God says, hey, when, when the, in the time when I reign, I can make this happen. No, 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 I will make this happen. The world will be transformed one day. And because of that, He's a God worth our worship. Verse 5. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, Micah says, but we, oh, we will walk in the name of Yahweh, our God forever and ever. Here's the payoff. Worship. All right? Why do we worship God? Because we know who he is. We don't just worship him because he is powerful. He is powerful. We worship him because he is good. He has this grand vision for our world, and he has the wisdom and the power to pull it off. That's the God we worship. We worship a peacemaking God. Well, actually, I could stop there. <laughs> That'd be a good place to end the talk, and we sing some songs celebrating God's grandeur and his power and what he's going to do on this world. It's going to be great, except for the fact that there's something else going on in this passage that's pretty important. Not least because I think it's actually Micah's main point. So, so here's the thing, okay? I'm, I'm, okay, I want to be clear. Micah does teach that our God is a peacemaking God, but there's something else going on here, and I can show it to you better if I show you the, the verse right before this passage. It's chapter 3, verse 12, the verse right before. It reads like this. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. Do you guys remember this verse? Does that ring a bell? This was part of the judgment section in one of the sermon by Pastor Chris Kopp. We have a lot of Chris's here. <laughs> so this was a part of a sermon called Leaders Leave Awake. And, and, and the you here, he's talking about the leaders of the people, right? And, and this is the passage where God says, because of the corruption of the leaders, Zion, Jerusalem, and the temple will be destroyed. Right? And, and these are not three different places, okay? The temple is in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is actually built on Mount Zion. So it's all talking about the same place, okay? And, and the destruction of these three things, they symbolize destruction of God's covenant people. Okay? So what's next verse? Pause. 
apology, the, the font's a little small here. But I want to show you these two verse passages next to each other. Right? You see, here's Zion. That's the mountain. That's the mountain. You have the mountain here. You have the mountain here. You have the mountain here. Oh, yeah, Zion down here. You have Jerusalem. Boom, right there. You have the temple. Temple, temple. Do you see it? The previous passage is God's promise of destruction and judgment against Zion Jerusalem temple representing the people of God. Immediately after that, we have this exaltation of Zion Jerusalem temple. Okay? Now, people who study Micah, they they tell us that these two passages are put together next to each other intentionally, okay? There's judgment and there is hope. And the hope is not just that the people will come back from exile and, or, or that the temple will be rebuilt and that Jerusalem will be populated again. But no, 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 no. It's talking about the exalted role that people of God will play in this grand vision of world peace. But let's dive in real quick. Let's dive in. In the last days, the mountain of Yahweh's temple will be, will be the highest of the mountains. Okay, Micah is not saying that somehow Mount Zion is going to get really, really tall. It's talking about its reputation. The wor- people in the world are going to go, whoa, that's an amazing people. We admire people over there. In fact, the people will come and they will stream to this mountain. They will stream there. Now, this is a perfect verb, perfect translation. What it translates is this Hebrew, Hebrew verb that's talking about river flowing. So you have this image in your head of a river of people, watery people, flowing upward. And who are these people? It just changed color on me. That's awesome. <laughs> nations. Nations are going to go there. Who are the nations again? The Goim, the ethnic groups, the different people groups. They're all going to gather. They're going to go to the mountain of God. They're going to go to Zion. They're going to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because we want to go and learn. We're going to go learn from people than them because we want to live in peace. Do you see that? That this passage is not just about God making peace. It's also about the people of God, right? The teaching. They're coming from Jerusalem, from Zion. Imagine world, there's crisis, there's conflict going on. And so what do people do? They say, hey, you know what? We need to send some people to Jerusalem. We need to send people over there to learn from Yahweh how to make peace. And we're going to bring it back. And this is the way in which God establishes peace on earth. This passage is about our God being a peacemaking God, using his people to make peace. Do you see that? Now, Micah is talking in the Old Testament, and for him, this is all happening over here. World peace. But we live in the aftermath of Jesus' coming. We're in the New Testament. So, what does it look like for us? So this is our, our, our timeline, right? So here's Jesus on the cross, dying for us, and then resurrecting, and then ascending into heaven and becoming the king of this new kingdom of God. It's already started. And, and the community that he built, the people that he built, that's the church, that's God's new people. We're God's new covenant people, and we're part of the kingdom of God, except... This broken world is still here. And so we all live here, living in this tension between these two worlds. So how does Micah's vision apply to us? Well, the part that talks about everything hunky-dory and the world is at peace, that's clearly in the future. That hasn't happened yet. That'll happen when Jesus returns and establishes his, his reign on earth fully. However, the thing about the kingdom of God is that whatever is in the future has a way of starting and finding its start at the beginning. The New Testament tells us, okay, the New New Testament tells us that the foundation for world peace has been laid by Jesus dying for us on the cross. Here's Colossians chapter 2, chapter 1. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. 
There's a lot going on there. Okay? But the idea is this. God is reconciling. God is making peace through the whole universe. He's pulling everything together. And he's going to do that. He's going to make everything to be at peace through the blood of Jesus on the cross. The foundation for peace is placed on the love and self-sacrifice of Jesus. Now, what is this peace? Well, the first peace there is is the peace between God and humanity. Right? Jesus' death on the cross reconciles us because God, Jesus takes our sins and he nails it on the cross and he kills it. Our sin is dead. Okay? That's the first peace that Jesus makes. But you know he makes also a second peace? He kills not only our sins, he kills ethnic hatred on the cross. Ephesians chapter 2. For Jesus himself is our peace between us, who has made the two groups one, I'll explain that in a bit, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with his commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, and thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the, through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. This passage is talking about ethnic hatred. And he's talking about the two groups, the Jews and the ethnos, the ethnic groups of the nations. And he's saying, on the cross, the hostility between the ethnic groups is destroyed. How does that happen? Well, it happens because Jesus on the cross created this thing called a one new humanity, okay? On the cross, Jesus creates a new people, a, 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 a new type of humans drawn from all different ethnic groups, different language groups, different na na national groups. By the way, this is the church, okay? Drawing them together and then killing ethnic hatred in this group of people. Distrust, fear, superiority, killed off so that we can love each other. So that instead of feeling that like, like, like uh, I, I don't, my, my group is better than their group. No, no, no. Instead, oh, your group is different. Wow, I'm really interested. I want to hear your story. I want to learn your perspective. I want to learn from you. I want to see how you see God differently from how I see God. Do you see that? Do you see that this passage says that the church is a community where ethnic hostility has been put to death? Do you see how a community like that might become a place, might become the God's tool for making world peace? Do you see how a community known and recognized by the world as a place where where, where Ethnic hostility is gone, replaced by mutual love, mutual submission, mutual service, might be a place where world leaders would call and go, hey, how do you guys do that? When you have people who are like, we're so sick of war, so sick of violence, so sick of anger and hatred, and they look at the church and they go, hey, show us what you have. Show us how you're doing it. Do you see how that might happen? Our God is a peacemaking God, and Jesus created a peacemaking church on the cross. Now, some of you are thinking, Charles, are you saying that if we do church right, presidents and prime ministers are going to call us up and ask us about the Middle East? You got it. That sounds preposterous. Yes, it does, because we don't know who we are. We think church, and we think, oh, our friends and family, people we see on Sundays, life group people, normal, average people, right? We look at, we look at Micah chapter 4, we go, oh, well, God's going to make more peace. Awesome. Go, God. Yay, God. Go, God. Great vision, God. And God's like, <laughs> you have no clue the role I want you to play in this vision. You have no clue who you are. Look, people, we are called to be a community where different ethnic groups come together, casting away fear and distrust and hatred and hostility, 
and join to love and serve each other in order to shine like a beacon in this dark and broken world that is wracked by ethnic hatred and ethnic warfare. Our God is a peacemaking God, and we are a peacemaking church. Now, I know this sounds very far-fetched. Sounds crazy. Like, world leaders coming to us, asking for help. Not gonna happen. Not believable. You're right. It's not believable. Because that's not where we start, okay? That's not what we aim for. Here's where we start. We start by aiming to be a community that Jesus died to create. We start by aiming to become a community where ethnic hostility is put to death. Before we can become peacemakers, we have to first be at peace. So, so here's, here's, here's my challenge to you, okay? Two, two next steps, two next steps. Number one, number one. And this should go without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, disdain for a person of a different color, of a different race, different ethnicity, different nationality, different language is wrong and has no place in the people of God. None. Now that's really easy to say. But man, is it hard. We live in the aftermath of so much hatred and anger and violence and conflict. It is in the air that we breathe. It is what we're wired for. That when we see a person who is different from us, initial reaction is fear. It's wanting to turn away, wanting to draw away. That's how we're wired. That's how we're built. And so we need the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. So step number one, today after the talk, we're going to have just a couple minutes. We're going to give some space for the Holy Spirit to do some excavation work in our lives. First, explore how the, this broken world has made their home in us so we can cast away whatever we have in terms of ethnic hostility. Challenge number two, to become a, a community that has put to death ethnic hostility, we need to become learners because this world is a complex place. Right here in Black Hawk Chinese ministry, we have people from mainland, from Hong Kong, from Mongolia, from Taiwan. We have the Han ethnic group, and then we have a bunch of other minority groups. If you know a little bit about China, you know the difficult waters that we're navigating. In our fledgling Spanish language group, there are already over 10 countries represented. That's 10 different value systems, 10 different history, 10 different cultures, 10 different worldviews. That's a lot of complexity to negotiate. And then here in this country, we have a difficult history. And we have complex relationships among all the different ethnic groups here in America. For a church to become multicultural, for a community to put ethnic hostility to death, we actually need to become learners. So this is the last Sunday in the, in the, in the month of May. I'm challenging you this coming month in June, do one concrete act of learning. Whether it's picking a book and reading with some friends, whether it's having somebody you already know who's, who's, who's at work or at school, somebody of a different background, different ethnic group, appropriately approach the person and get to know them better. Know more about their background. Know more about their history. If, if you want to, um, go to this resource page, resource page. Under the Faith and Faith resources, blackhawk.church slash race hyphen faith, or use your, do the QR code. If you don't have your phone up early enough, we're going to put this up again later, when, uh, later at the, in, in the service. So have your phone ready, okay? Go there. There are lists of podcasts, there's sermons, there's books re recommendation, all kinds of material. Pick one, read it, watch it, listen to it. Learn something on this topic because we want to be a community that puts to death ethnic hostility. Look, we, we, we look out there and we see warfare based on that ethnic hatred. We, we see the the violence in our own country because of ethnic hatred. The horrific shootings in, 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 in Lake Laguna Wood, California, and the Taiwanese church. That, that horrific scene in, in Buffalo, New York, in that supermarket. There are no words for what this has done to our world. And it, be, it can easily become despairing. 
and say, nothing you can do. This is just how the world is broken. But we are different. We have hope. We do not despair because we worship a peacemaking God. And he will remake this world. And more than that, he calls us, this community, to show the world the kind of peace that God can create. So let us become a community where ethnic hostility goes to die. The question for us today is not, why is the world so dark? The question for us today is, why doesn't the church shine brighter? Imagine with me a world in which the church is known for a place that ethnic hostility has ceased, that there is love, service, mutual understanding, putting forth other groups ahead of our own, going beneath, putting our interests aside. Imagine that world, a church known for that. Imagine Blackout. We, we've been on this journey toward becoming a multicultural church. Imagine that we keep making progress. We become a place where we, we love each other and know each other across racial lines, racial barriers, across language barriers, across ethnic barriers. Imagine the impact that would have on our community. The people of Madison coming and say, hey, how are you doing that? That's our calling. That's Micah's vision for us. Let me pray for us. Father, we want to be a people that makes peace. We want to be the people that you called us to be, that you created on the cross where ethnic hostility is dead. We know it's not but that's what we, we want. Your, your Bible says these amazing things about us that, that are just, it's like mind-boggling how you see us and how it's different from how we see ourselves. And Father, we want to adopt your glasses and we want to see us through your lens. And we want to be the people that you created us to be. So help us do that, Father. Help us be the place where ethnic hostility goes to die. We need your power. We need your Holy Spirit. We can't do this on our own. For your glory, for the sake of, your, for the, sake of the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, what a, a compelling vision, right, of how God could use us, his church, to bring about peace and this kind of flourishing that Charles just talked about. But in order for us to partner with God and to be used in that way, we have to do some hard work in our own hearts and our own lives to be the kind of people and the type of community that he's able to use in that way. And so rather than just singing a couple songs and driving home, we want to take a moment to press into this and to pray and to have an opportunity for reflection. Uh, these aren't easy questions to think through and to answer. They might be a little uncomfortable, but even in my own life, I need to do the hard work of looking inside at ways where I'm falling short in this area. I need to continue to do that. I'm a work in progress when it comes to these types of things. So for the next uh, couple minutes, there will be a couple questions, a couple prompts on the screen for about 30 seconds each. So um, Take that as an opportunity to do business with God. Pray, reflect. Um, those will each be up there for about a half a minute, and then we'll close in prayer together. But go ahead, use this as an opportunity to, to pray and to, to seek the Lord.
it's obviously not enough time to begin to dig into those questions fully. So I want to invite you to continue to process and to pray through that as you go from here. But having at least started the individual work of processing through that, I want to invite us to pray this prayer together out loud. Um, this is a prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, that we would be the kind of church, the kind of community that embodies these things. So let's read this out loud together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Everybody sat together, amen. Let's continue in an attitude of worship. Let's sing a couple songs to close our time. As you uh, feel led, feel free to stand up and worship with us. Remind us. 
us with sisters and brothers Tear down the walls Help us to love one another Well, we worship a God who is victorious. He's the ruler of the nations. He will bring peace. Let's worship him together. Here we go. being here with us today. It's so great to get to worship with you. Uh, today's message, I don't know about you, for me that was inspiring and challenging. Inspired because the vision of what the church can be, 
to think of the world looking at the church and saying, man, that's how you do it. Uh, I love that vision. But also challenging because it's got that component of where's my heart at? How am I in this area? And so I want to put that QR code back on the screen for you guys. Uh, you can pull your phone out, use your camera, and scan that code. It'll take you to our Race and Faith page. And there's a ton of resources, um, probably too many for most of us to try and, you know, tackle. But grab one of those resources. just want to encourage you, you know, what is it for you this week? Take one uh, step towards learning, uh, towards growing in our desire to cross boundaries of culture and race. And so I just want to encourage you that way. We'll leave that up there for a few more moments. Uh, take a look at what it might be for you. And I don't know about you, but for me, there's a component too of like, oh yeah, I'll do that. I'll totally do that. And then I go home and I forget to do that. Um, so maybe you want to reach out to a friend or maybe you want to reach out to uh, a couple of close people in your life to go, hey, can we do this book together? Maybe over the month of June or over the summer. Let's listen to this podcast. I'd love to talk about it at some point uh, in the future. So let me just encourage you, think about ways that you can do this, ways that you can grow in your own desire uh, to cross the boundaries of culture and race. As our benediction today, I want to use the words from Micah chapter 6. Uh, I want this to be a call for us. Uh, it goes like this. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? And then here's the answer, and here's what I want our benediction to be today as a church. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have a great week.